Yeah. All right. Thank you. Uh, thank you, everybody, for joining us today. Just um, a little bit of housekeeping before we get started. Um, as you join the call, if you can please stay muted uh, during the call. Uh, we are expecting um, a, a decent number of participants today and want to limit any type of background noise. We will take questions throughout the presentation, and we do have a designated time at the end for Q&A. You have a chat function, um, so please feel free to write in any questions uh, during today's presentation. So I want to thank all of you for joining us today for the value of advice, wealth transfer strategies for art and other passion assets. My name is Colleen Boyle, and I'm the Senior Vice President at Paul Mall Art Advisors, and I'm going to be your moderator today. I'm going to start by introducing our panelists. Joining us today, we have Dan Cooper, who is a partner with Morgan Lewis and Bacchus. Uh, Dan helps individuals and families develop plans for estate and gift taxes, family business succession, and philanthropy. Additionally, he provides counsel on the management of personal financial interests on a national and international scale. Dan also regularly handles fiduciary income tax, gift tax, estate tax, and generation skipping transfer tax issues. Today, Dan will be addressing tax issues related to passion assets and wealth transfer on our panel. Next, we have Jim Volkman joining us today. And Jim serves as the Managing Director of Financial Valuation Services. In that capacity, he's responsible for the performance and the management of all financial valuation engagements undertaken by the company. Jim has considerable experience in the valuation of intangible assets. His appraisals have included complex patent and non-patent technologies, as well as agent contracts with actors, musicians, and professional sports figures. Today, Jim will be discussing uh, discounting as well as fractional interest and how that's related to art and other passion assets. And lastly, we have Anita Harriet, who is the president of Palmall Art Advisors, an independent appraisal and art advisory firm with experts in all collecting, uh, in all areas of collecting from fine art to collector cars. Anita is a member of the Appraisers Association of America, and she's testified as a special witness in major court cases involving art valuations and regularly lectures on topics relating to art, collecting, and appraising. Anita has appeared on several TV shows, and she is frequently interviewed by the media for her insights into the art world. So we're going to start today's panel um, with Anita. So Anita, this past year has been more than a little tumultuous. There's been countless crises surrounding the global pandemic and social and political ruptures, altering nearly every aspect of daily life. Can you share your insights on how the art and collectible markets have been impacted by all the disruption in 2020? Absolutely. Thanks so much, Colleen, and thanks for all the panelists for joining us today. It should be a very interesting panel. You know, I certainly can discuss the impact of COVID and all the other disruption on the tangible assets of value. But I also want to mention before I discuss that, that this whole discussion of wealth transfer strategies, you know, 20 years ago, this wasn't really a conversation that we needed to have with such um, with such depth. And that's primarily because what we've seen over the last 10 to 15 years is a dramatic change in um, the art market and other blue chip tangible assets. As a result of this huge increase in value, fine art, post-war contemporary art, specifically collector cars, French wine, um, important jewelry, suddenly we've looked at this part of our portfolio as something that actually needs to be managed. So what I would say is, you know, when a lot of the wealth firms, Deloitte as accounting firm as an example, has really done the due diligence and has determined that somewhere between, you know, 10 and 15 percent of our overall portfolio for the high net worth client is in these tangible assets of value. Hence, that is why we need to have a wealth transfer strategy for this aspect of the portfolio. So that's number one. Number two, what's happened as a result of COVID and other disruptions in the marketplace as well? Well, number one, 
we have seen a decrease overall in the trading of art um, within the secondary market or the auction marketplace. We've seen a constriction in the gallery marketplace. Many have shut down with a lot of the market leaders also contracting somewhat in terms of their overall personnel. Museums have shut their doors and as a result, exhibitions featuring very important artists, which dramatically shape the market for those artists have been online. So just looking at kind of the ecosystem of the art market, there's been obvious issues. But out of it, we've also seen some incredible developments, and I don't think we're ever going to go back to the way we were. And those incredible developments are really in the online marketplace. We've seen just from January to June of um, 2020, we saw a 460% increase in online trading of, for instance, art in the art marketplace. We could never have imagined that a $40 million work of art would be sold online with only people being able to do a hybrid viewing of these pieces with no one sitting in an auction room. So what I will say is, if in kind of simply, post-war contemporary continues to reign supreme. Um, blue chip assets in the tangible asset market, um, for instance, you know, Cartier, colored diamonds, continue to reign supreme. Um, but we also are online now, and we we will see more and more trading in the secondary market using online venues, which is really, really interesting and really, really powerful. Um, so that's just a little bit about the market as of today, Colleen. Thanks, Anita. Would you be able to share uh, with the attendees today just some of the more specific uh, art markets that have been impacted? So, for example, you mentioned post-war and yeah. contemporary blue chip assets in general most likely um, have possibly been on the rise in 2020. Um, are you able to share uh, any more specificity around some of these subgroups on, on yeah. maybe areas yeah. that have appreciated during COVID? So when we look at, for instance, African-American artists, we're not talking about emerging artists, we're talking about mid-career artists, specifically artists represented by major museums and um, major galleries. We've seen a uh, secondary market for African-American artists increase quite dramatically. In addition, female artists, we have seen almost no decrease in the value in the secondary mar market for important female artists. Um, Joan Mitchell would be an excellent example. Her market continues to climb. Bridget Riley's market continues to climb and so on and so forth. But we've also seen a decline. So the modern and impressionist market has plateaued and dipped even, and that's for a couple reasons. One, a lot of older people, and sadly I have to put myself in that category now, a, a lot of older generation are not comfortable selling in the online marketplace. American paintings, same, um, old, tend to be owned by an older generation and very uncomfortable about selling them in the online marketplace. So supply is down, prices are down. Um, so we've kind of seen, even within the art marketplace, you can segment it, you know, in that way to look at all the different aspects of the of the marketplace. Thanks, Anita. Um, Dan, let's let's switch over to you now. Anita mentioned that there's several asset classes where we're seeing um, appreciation, specifically with mid-career uh, artists of color and female artists, as well as other types of blue chip assets that are seeing uh, potential appreciation and value, along with segments that are uh, equally depreciating. Um, with the change, particularly uh, going into 2021 politically, what are your what are you hearing about potential changes in the gift and estate tax laws, and and why is this a good time? for gift uh, and or sales transactions. Thank you, sorry, muted. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, thank, thank you for having me on the panel and thanks to all our attendees for participating. And uh, that's a very good question. Um, just to level set, the way that it works currently is that everyone has $11.7 million of gift tax exemption which is the ability to make gifts without paying a tax. And whatever gift tax exemption you haven't used when you pass away, that becomes your estate tax exemption. And there's another tax system for passing things down to grandchildren and lower levels called the generation skipping transfer tax. Everyone also has $11.7 million of that exemption. Uh, 
And of course, we have all Democrats in Washington now, so we are expecting there to be some changes to the tax laws. And that was one of the things that President Biden mentioned several times during the election. Uh, our expectation, and nobody really knows, is that a lot of that will concentrate on lowering those exemption amounts. Uh, we've heard rumblings that it may go down to something like three and a half million dollars per person, which was the exemption several years ago. Uh, but we've also heard some other things that impact today's discussion that are of interest. Uh, one thing is there's some concentration on potentially getting rid of the basis step up on assets when somebody passes away, which is always relevant in our planning. And you always have to weigh estate tax planning and gift tax planning against basis step up or the loss of the basis step up. What that effectively means is if the basis step up goes away, you can't sell something after somebody dies and have no capital gains tax. You would effectively have capital gains tax on the difference between what you paid for something, which is often the basis, and it's then value when you went to sell it. Will that happen? It's hard to say. There's a lot of policy reasons why the law is as it is, uh, but that's something that is being talked about quite a bit, and there have been quite a few news articles on that. There's also been quite a bit of talk about valuation discounts. This was a proposal we saw from the Obama administration that never got traction, although there was quite a bit of discussion in the IRS uh, and folks in Washington tried to make it happen where valuation discounts, and James will get into that in more detail, potentially could go away. So that could have a tremendous impact on how we do things and where there's opportunities. Um, and then there's talk not only about the exemption amount and those more technical issues, basis and the like, but there's also talk about changing the rate. Right now, the rate is 40%, and that rate, we think, could go up so that not only do you have less exemption, but you also have a higher tax rate, so sort of a double whammy there. Uh, the other thing that we've seen, and this is sort of segueing into why it's a good time to plan, is that the interest rates that we do a lot of our planning with, which is called the AFR rate, which are IRS minimum interest rates, are at extreme lows. They have risen over the last several months from lows we saw a few months ago, but are, ex are still extremely slow, are extremely low. And many of the techniques that we use, and we may get into that if there's time, uh, rely on those rates. So what, why do you do planning now? If you look at the combination of the potential for law changes, you look at potentially decreased values for things, uh, and you look at one thing I didn't mention is that the law and the exemption amounts also sunset the end of 2025. Plus, we have all Democrats in Washington. We're sort of at a time where it makes sense to absolutely do planning, because if you don't use those exemptions and they do go away, you essentially would lose the ability to use those greater exemption amounts. So that combined with the low interest rates and the, still, the ability to still discount and all of those things really makes it an opportune time to think about planning. There's lots of ways to skin a cat on the planning, but a great time to start thinking about it. Great. Thanks, Dan. And Dan, we're seeing um, a lot of our clients transferring these passion assets, whether it's art or jewelry or other types of collectibles. Um, out of their personal estate and into trusts or LLCs or, or a vehicle along that line. Can you just share some insight? Why would someone give passion assets to a trust as compared to other types of assets? Sure. So there's lots of reasons for that. Uh, one reason that we often see is simply they believe that that asset is either at a low value and has a lot of room for growth in the value, or they believe that even if it's not a low value, there's still a lot of room. And you generally, when you're using those precious tax exemptions, want to use your most appreciating assets. So sometimes it's just that the passion asset is that asset. Another reason that we often plan with those sorts of assets as compared to, let's say, cash, marketable securities, other assets which may be growing in value, is because as much as somebody loves their passion asset, absent taking out some lending against it or other things like that, you can't spend a piece of artwork. And we always have to be careful when we're doing our estate planning that we don't hurt 
somebody's lifestyle and take assets away from them that they need to spend to facilitate their living expenses. So if you use a passion asset, any sort of intangible asset that isn't cash flowing per se, you can chew up some of that exemption that might go away and you can put that in a trust vehicle and you've used your exemption, you've hopefully put a growing asset into a trust, but you haven't really taken away in a meaningful way from your ability to spend with your other assets. And I think that's gonna be an important consideration over the next few years where we're expecting those law changes. We need to use exemption and depending on the client and their situation, we just don't wanna over plan them in a way where they're uncomfortable. And it seems to me that those passion assets might be an ideal item to gift into trusts so that you're doing that tax planning without a tremendous impact on lifestyle. Okay, great, thank you. And Anita, you mentioned um, earlier that you're seeing not only appreciation in certain segments, but also depreciation in certain segments of the art and collectible market. Um, clients are always trying to figure out, is it best to sell their objects during their lifetime or, or do they wait till after death? And depending on the situation, particularly if it's an asset that's depreciated, uh, maybe it's better to sell during lifetime or the opposite. If a object is at its all time high and a client wants to take advantage of uh, the strength of the marketplace, again, maybe it is more appropriate to sell during lifetime. But whether a client sells during lifetime or after death, can you talk about just the, is there a, a, a preferred methodology that you'd recommend on taking objects and collections to sale? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Colleen. Um, so the first thing I would say is that the best methodology for what we call monetization or taking pieces to sale is to not be lazy. And I know that's such a silly thing to say, but like every other aspect of our portfolio, when we make a decision to sell within that portfolio, it requires significant due diligence. And what does it mean when we talk about due diligence as it relates to tangible assets, whether it's a car or wine or artwork? First, you start with value. So just like Colleen said, you have to know, has it appreciated or depreciated? And how does that affect the strategy in terms of sale? Once you've decided to sell, then it's extremely important to understand what is the best market for sale. Calling an auction house and having them come in and take it away is not a strategy for sale. What you want to figure out is, one, is there a strong secondary market, meaning an auction market place for it? Two, what is the best auction marketplace for this particular piece? Three, maybe there are two or three different auction marketplaces that make the most sense. So let's say a Sotheby's and a Christie's and a Phillips. And then you really need to do your due diligence and figure out which one makes the best sense for the object. Once you've chosen where you're going to sell it, then actually the work begins. I hate to tell you, you have to make sure it's marketed correctly. You want to make sure your piece is within the context of a sale where you're going to get the most focus. So you don't want to sell in a sale where there are four Picassos like yours. And then you want to make sure it's estimated correctly. The, the last thing you ever want is for your work to go unsold because for a bunch of reasons. If it goes unsold and then you decide you want to donate it, guess what the new price is, right? The reserve price because it's gone unsold. Um, if you want to sell it again, that record will follow it to the end of time. So you want to make sure those estimates are absolutely appropriate for sale. And then once it is sold, um, you want to make sure that you receive the revenue in the appropriate time frame. So there's a lot of negotiation, a lot of due diligence. So you really want to make sure you treat it like you do every other asset with that level of due diligence. Thanks, Anita. And the one thing we also see, um, in addition to the venue, is the geographic region. Uh, I don't know if you want to opine on that. Sometimes it might make more sense to sell something in London versus New York, say, versus California. Do you want to just share a little bit of insight on geography as well and how that can impact the value of a sale? 
Well, absolutely. And again, you know, what when we say we're looking at the right auction house or right dealer for, for that matter, um, we really want to understand the context of the collection. So, for instance, we're currently working with a pre Raphaelite collection. We have followed and tracked every single sell through rate for every single important pre Raphaelite painting. And we've made the determination that it is a specific auction house in a spe specific region, which is London. So, I, I like to say every painting, every object has its own story to tell, and you have to take into account geographic reason, region, and also sell through rate and success within the context of that market. Okay, thank you, Anita. And Dan, you'd mentioned earlier, uh, there's obviously potential for tax law changes and clients are trying to take advantage of um, the current situation, particularly with appreciating assets. The worst thing is clients who are transferring objects out of their personal estate, but then they're they're contemplating possibly a, a leaseback transaction. Can you just share with the group today what's the best type of trust structure for either a gift sale or a leaseback situation of passion assets, and how does that work? Sure, thanks. That's a really good question, and we are seeing so much of that. I think you know, five, six, seven years ago, you didn't hear so much conversation. Uh, about leasing back assets that were gifted to trusts. That has really become a, an important conversation today. So just a little bit more of a basic lesson on estate planning, because it's important to understand the relevance of the lease back. Essentially, if you're doing estate planning in a basic way and you're gifting something to a trust, the idea is you're no longer supposed to be using that asset. And we run into lots and lots of clients where you found that they've gifted a piece of artwork or a passion asset. And then you say, well, where is that? And it's still hanging on the wall in their house. That's essentially an estate planning no-no. So the way that, that you, you typically cover that sort of situation, and this is permissible, is that you can gift something to a trust and then you can pay fair market value to lease it back. And you have to get the value right. There's always valuation risk. So you need to understand both the value of the object and then the appropriate uh, cost of that lease. And then you have to make the lease payments. And all of those steps are, are really, really important. Uh, when, we, when we are starting fresh and we're planning with a passion asset and we want to use that for a gifting transaction, if it's going to remain in the home of the donor and we're going to be doing a lease back, our preferred trust structure for that is simply a trust that's for the benefit of the descendants, not the donor or the donor spouse who may be gifting that asset. That's because if you are gifting the asset, you're still not supposed to use it absent the lease. And if you're gifting the asset and you, let's say the spouse was a beneficiary of the trust, that creates a lot of complexity and uncertainty for the overall structure. So you want sort of a more basic trust in that set up where you're going to be leasing it back. You still have to be mindful that with the lease back, you're giving up access. So if you gift that asset to a trust, a few years later, you decide to sell it. You have a trust that has money for the kids and it's the mom and dad can't really access that money in any sort of clean way. So that's a downside of that basic structure. An upside of the lease is that because you're putting payments into the trust, those aren't counted as additional gifts to the trust, but they're akin essentially to tax free gifts to the trust because every time you make that payment, the trust just keeps the money and can invest it in any way that it sees fit. And you're able to reduce the size of your estate, not only with the initial big gift of the asset, but with those small gifts of the lease payments. There are lots of other trust structures that we use where a lease back wouldn't be involved where the donor and the donor spouse may be, able to, may be able to have access to the asset that's gifted and make use of the asset. And there's other trust structures that we use where the valuation would be precarious for whatever reason that have less valuation risk. It really is a situation specific setup. But I, again, at the basic level, especially if you're doing the lease back, I would tend to think about a trust for descendants and more basic sort of trust structure and the lease back. Okay, thanks, Dan. And we have a, a question I'm going to address now uh, from one of the attendees. It says that uh, they're interested in using uh, tax for lease back assets and specifically for New York City. Is there a track record 
that stands up to the leases to the leaseback model if it's a Delaware trust, for example. Is that is that clear? Is that question clear? It's not entirely clear, but let me take a stab at it. So we 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 do lots of trusts in different jurisdictions for different reasons. Sometimes sort of the hot places we do that now are Delaware and South Dakota. You hear it about trust in Alaska, and those are things we see all of the time. They don't really have a tremendous impact on what I just described. The sale and the lease back and being mindful of the rules are both basically a federal issue. So it shouldn't matter which state the trust uh, is located in or which state law governs, uh, at least in terms of being managed of managing the gift tax laws and the estate tax laws. Okay, great. And Anita, um, Paul Moll's gotten many requests for this type of appraisal transaction. Can you uh, just share with the group, what's the appraiser's role in a leaseback rental transaction? Absolutely. Um, so it all starts just like Dan said with value. So we really need to understand what is that fair market value for the objects that are going to be gifted and leased back. So sometimes we start with the gift tax. We're asked to do the gift tax valuation, which would be fair market value. For anyone that doesn't understand what fair market market value is, fair market value is basically willing buyer, willing seller in an open and transparent market in which no one is forced to buy or sell. Um, what that really means is what would you pay for it at auction, right? So it's hammer plus premium is fair market value. So we start with the value. Once we understand the value, then we have to come up with what that rental cost would be. And it really depends. We have done deep, deep analysis on how to determine rental value. And it depends on the asset. It really depends on the asset. So we have two different ways of looking at that rental income. One is if it is a what we call a blue chip fine art work of art. And then there's one kind of way in which we analyze um, that rental cost. If it is in fact kind of furniture, decorative arts, contents of a home, we have a different strategy for analyzing that particular um, asset. So it depends on what it is. And then we determine what that annual rate will be um, in order to um, rent it, breaking it down month by month. So just to be clear, Anita, so the the rental percentage is most likely going to be different, say for a $10 million piece of artwork compared to a $100,000 piece of artwork. And then in addition, probably different than say uh, a, a, a collection of cars or a collection of jewelry. Is that correct? Completely, absolutely accurate. Um, and there are very good um, reasons behind that. And we provide that narrative and we provide those then the math around that in very specific ways. Okay. And a question's come in from the group. Um, uh, the question is, can you give an example of a leaseback assets usage specifically on a classic or collector vehicle that's still driven and being shown at events? So I guess part of the question is, and um, Dan, maybe you can address this as well as Anita and even Jim, can that vehicle, can that be put into the, the lease itself? Uh, can you still use the object if it's part of the lease back transaction? Uh, are there any limitations in that respect? And the same would apply to art. Can it be on exhibit? Uh, are there any limitations? Sure, so we do this sort of setup with all sorts of things, art, real estate, and, and others. And a lot of this comes down to how you set up your lease. So to make things easy on the planning, we usually set up what's essentially akin to a triple net recent lease in the real estate context, or a lease where the uh, person who is the tenant or the person who is holding the interest and use of the assets pays all the bills. And that's because the trust oftentimes, unless it has other assets, doesn't have any cash flow other than the rental payments to be able to essentially pay all the bills. So if that's a piece of artwork, obviously you have insurance. If you have a car, you have gas and insurance and all of the things that it takes to move around that car to the various shows. And the real magic in this is making the lease appropriate. Our advice generally is that when you go to draft that lease, you put none of that responsibility on the trust and you put it all on the person who is um, entering into the lease with the trust. 
Um, and that usually, that usually solves the, the problem there. One thing I did want to clarify, oftentimes in our leases, and again, the magic's in the lease here, so that we don't need an appraisal every year, you would create a lease. It could be for a certain term. Let's say that's two, three, four, or five years with some renewals, just like you think of a lease of a piece of real estate. And we'll often adjust the value for CPI, which is sort of an easy measure to increase the uh, rent. And then you have to re up on your valuation at some point. So, because you're doing family planning and estate planning, it isn't quite the same as a third party context. You're able to build in some convenient features in the lease to accommodate those things. And just, just going back to the question about the Delaware Trust, if I was understanding properly, I saw a couple more comments pop up uh, in the chat box. Oftentimes when you set up a trust, it's what's called a grantor trust, which means that the settler, who would be the person entering into the lease with the trust, they're also the income tax payer. And for most states, but not Pennsylvania, that can be both state and federal taxes. So essentially the trust is ignored for tax purposes which means you're not taking on any taxable income in the trust during the lease term. That rental payment is ignored for income tax purposes. Thank you. And just one more question related to uh, the lease, and this has to do with insurance. So Dan, uh, would, it, would the insurance for these items, because again, we're talking about in many cases, valuable assets that have been transferred into the trust and are being leased back, is the insurance policy in the name of the trust or in the name of the the individual or the individual leasing back? Yeah, I, again, a lot of that ends up being handled in the lease, and of course, the valuation for the rental payments takes into account who's bearing all those responsibilities. You could very easily have a trust pay the insurance premium, and that item that's being leased would account for the fact that the insurance premium is being paid by the trust and the leaseholder doesn't need to pay that premium. I think with insurance, what you might find, uh, again, akin to a building, is that both the landlord and tenant would have some responsibility for insurance. But I know for our planning purposes and cash flow purposes, it typically works out better unless the trust has other cash flow to make it so that the trust has as little responsibility to pay things as possible. Because oftentimes, especially if you create a new trust and put a piece of artwork or another passion asset into it, there's essentially no money until you start to build up some money with the lease payments. So I think you would want to be cautious about how you divide that up, but there's no rhyme or reason to it. It's all really determined by the lease, which is a contract, and, and you can make it work the way you want to. And then the valuation would accommodate. Thank you. Thanks for that clarification. Jim, we're gonna we're gonna switch uh switch gears and move over to uh talking with you for a little bit. So your background is business uh, valuations. So can you share with the group um, what type of role are you seeing, particularly with passion assets, art, jewelry, collectibles, cars, uh, specifically from the standpoint of fractional interest and discounting? Uh, can you just share with you uh, what, what you're seeing uh, in estate planning related to these types of assets from a business appraiser's perspective? Sure, yeah. Um... We get involved in a lot of estate work. Um, typically, there's uh, two types of assets uh, that we're dealing with, uh, either operating businesses um, uh, whose stock is going into uh, a trust, uh, or we're dealing with holding companies uh, with old things like the estate um, uh, and passion assets. Um, so what we have uh, with business uh, valuation um, is a, uh, a greater ability uh, to look at the economics um, and create models uh, that um, quantify the discount. And as opposed to a discount, what I really like to think of it um, as is the reality of illiquidity. Um, you all know that you can't just take a valuable uh, piece of artwork and go down and, and get cash for it the next day. Uh, it takes time, um, it takes costs, and it takes costs following the sale. Uh, 
Um, and that's what we're trying to recognize um, with what they prefer to call a discount. Market value uh, to recognize that you're not going to receive cash equivalent uh, to what the appraiser says the asset is by the time um, you sold it. Um, and uh, different types of assets uh, face different levels of liquidity. Um, a share of stock you can sell in a day. Um, a share of stock at a private company it could take you two or three years uh, to find a willing buyer. Um, selling art is relatively easy, um, although it may take time and expense. Um, if you own all of it, but what if you don't own all of it, uh, right. that only increases the difficulty with which you'll have in trying to convert that ownership interest into cash. Now, for 40 years, the IRS has been trying to do away uh, with recognizing uh, the reality of liquidity discounts, um, particularly in transfers um, among family members. Um, you know, they say that families all work in concert um, for the benefit of all. Um, <laughs> but by working uh, in estates, um, as demonstrated, that's not always true. Uh, so, uh, discounts, I believe, are still appropriate um, and uh, do reflect the uh, reality. And then, Jim, do do these? Um, yeah, yes. Go ahead, Anita. Can I make a, I make a comment on Jim's Jim's yes, comment? I mean, Jim, I think you're like right on the money here. No pun intended. Um, you know, we have a, a circumstance right now where we have. Um, two siblings that co-own a very, very important painting. And it was difficult just to get one to agree to ship it to one storage facility versus another, more or less trying to convince one to sell and one doesn't want to. So I think soon as you have fractional interest as it relates to artwork or any other passion asset, you are absolutely, you can't cut a painting in half like right. you could maybe a piece of land. Um, so you're correct. I think the reality of liquidity is a good way to look at it. Uh, I'm looking at a fractional interest in farmland um, in Kansas um, as part of a um, uh, marital dissolution. They can't agree on um, which party gets which parcels of land. <laughs> so, so, Jim, can you walk us through an example of discounting? So, you know, whether it's a divorce situation or in Anita's example, you know, two siblings own a piece of artwork. Um, let's just take us if we could use just a specific example to explain to uh, all the uh, all the registrants on the who are participating in today's pa uh, panel discussion. Let's just suppose it's a quarter of a million dollar painting. Um, what would that discounting look like? How does how does it work? Does the does the art object have to be held in a corporation? Is the discount uh, the same on a piece of artwork as it would be on a piece of farmland? Can you just kind of walk us through what that process looks like? Ah, uh, sure. Um, the fractional interest uh, valuations uh, or disc studies um, have to consider the type of asset involved, uh, and which have to envision. Uh, is a hypothetical situation where uh, you're the half owner at painting. Um, you need to raise cash. Um, you can convince a judge um, that uh, you need to dispose of this asset. Uh, and then you count up all of the costs that would be involved um, in turning that fair market value uh, into the bundle of cash that you would receive at the end of the day. Um, 
in a piece of uh, real estate, uh, you're dealing with um, commission costs. Uh, you're probably dealing with closer to order liquidation value than fair market value uh, mm -hmm. because you are going to push for a quick sale of the property. Um, you have appraisal costs, you have survey costs, um, and there are analogous costs um, when we're talking about um, fine arts or collectibles. And Jim, with your experience, have you seen all different types of assets being used uh, from the from, from a discounting perspective? Are you, are, have you seen art and jewelry and collector cars, or does it tend to be more asset specific? Well, <laughs> from my perspective, I tend to see um, um, uh, vacation homes. Um, uh, some personal property uh, assets, um, less along the lines of collectible um, and more utilitarian, uh, uh, but still uh, you go through the same process uh, to figure out what it would take to sell that uh, asset, deduct it from its fair market value, and then multiply uh, by your ownership interest. Colleen, can I can I just make one more comment? You know, when we are asked to do uh, fractional interest and discounting, um, we know we're very good at the fair market value. We've got that. But we also know that those that have been in business valuation and been doing it for regardless of the asset really understand the math around it. So we like to collaborate with a valuation, business valuation expert to do that discounting. We think it's something the IRS wants to see, um, and we find it to be very, very effective. So this collaboration between the two different appraisal firms is extremely important. And I, I and I just for those that are watching, if you are asking for a fractional interest and a discount, be careful who is doing that valuation for you, and make sure you have the right folks looking at those numbers. And I'll, and I'll just put a finer point on that too. So. So what does this all amount to? You do your gift planning, you bring in Paul Mall, you bring in James, you're doing your discounting for fractional interests. Where the rubber meets the road, you file the gift tax return reporting what it is you've done. And effectively the underlying assets, the artwork and other passion assets, that report becomes an input, if you will, to the business valuation input, which takes the discount for the fractional interest or what have you. But both of those reports become something that's reported to the IRS to get a statute of limitations running on a gift tax return. And both are of equal importance. Thank you, Dan. And and, and on that note, Anita, um, there's a question from one of the attendees about the different types of valuations. And, you know, Jim mentioned, uh, you know, um, a, a very conservative approach when dealing with uh, a land transaction and discounting. You mentioned fair market value. Uh, obviously, there's retail replacement. Can you just share the types of valuations that are, are most often used for tax and estate situations? And then just opine a little bit on um, just some of the IRS guidelines, some of the expectations, the reviews over certain value points uh, that uh, the IRS is really concerned about in the due diligence in those reports. Sure. No, it'd be at my absolute pleasure. There's nothing I like to talk more about than value. Um, and that's primarily because I think this is the area that needs to be most demystified. Most of our clients don't understand how we determine value and which value is important for which purpose. Um, so one thing you might want to think about if you think about an object that you own is that it's going to have a minimum of five values that are associated with that object. <laughs> and you don't think of it that way, right? You say to someone, how much is it worth? And they just give a number. But what number are they actually giving? So let's just think about one object and let's look at the different values we're talking about here. If you buy an object at a gallery, that's an insurance value, right? So for insurance, you're talking about, it has nothing to do with what you're gonna to provide to the IRS, which is basically a retail replacement value. What would you pay for it? the highest price you would pay for it in a retail setting. That's what you use for insurance, and it is completely irrelevant, generally speaking, to anything to do with planning or the IRF, with one exception, which I can explain in a moment. 
the, the value that's going to be most important for that same object you're thinking about is fair market value, which I've already discussed. And fair market value is really looking at the auction marketplace and why from the IRS don't they care about a gallery price? What they're looking for is a lack of opaqueness. They want transparency. And when you have an auction, you have a, someone who can put up their hand or not and buy something. So anyone has the ability to buy this object, which makes it a transparent transaction. So the IRS wants us primarily to look at what someone would pay for an object at auction that is similar and like, hopefully within the last two years. There are exceptions to everything because you may have very unusual object, but then all the IRS wants us to do is explain why. So it's really all about doing the due diligence, examining the categories of analysis for an object, and figuring out what that is paid auction. The third kind of value, which we use for collateral, has nothing to do with the IRS, would be marketable cash value. So if you were to sell that object or default on a loan, what would that price be? Well, that would be hammer price, right? So what is hammer without premium? What would a seller get? Now, some of you will go to an auction house with that same object and say, what's this worth? And they're going to give you an estimate of value, right? They might say five to $7,000. That's not a value, people. An estimate of value is a range of numbers to galvanize interest for bidding. It is not a value. And that last kind of value is that liquidation value, which we just talked about, right? When someone is forced to sell, or we can also look at blockage discounts also in that scenario when too much is coming to market. So lots of different kinds of value for one object, many different methodologies for different purposes, but fair market value is the most important. Anything that's going to the IRS, you need full cataloging. In addition to full catalog, you need good photography. You need a mention of condition. Many of the IRS panels, um, appraisals that they flag, because they don't understand condition. So you want a note of condition, a discussion of condition, and then comparables in the marketplace. Thanks, Anita. Do you want to mention just about the $50,000 threshold as well? Sure. So the IRS, as you know, has something called the art panel. The art panel meets twice a year. They are not IRS hacks. They are people brought in from the private realm who really know tangible assets of value, post-war contemporary specialists, English furniture specialists. So they meet twice a year to review appraisals that their internal team have flagged. And if you have an object valued over $50,000 fair market value and an appraisal is submitted, it can be flagged by the internal team at the IRS. And if it's flagged, they'll review the whole appraisal. And then it will go to the panel if they decide it is necessary. Thanks, Anita. Thanks for that clarification. Uh, so you, you really want to be prudent, uh, especially any type of report that's going to be going to the IRS, IRS related, that you're you're really clear on um, the the value that the report's done correctly and according to IRS guidelines. Uh, similar to the uh, art and collectible markets, you have to keep in mind that uh, the appraisal industry is not highly regulated uh, like the wealth legal and uh, CPA industries are. So you really have to make sure you're choosing the right uh, valuation company when you're involved with any type of IRS transaction. And I want to kind of, we're heading towards the end of our, our time period. And I, I wanted just to address one more issue that's come up uh, from one of the attendees. And it's something that we're seeing quite regularly with clients who are in the process of um, planning. There's all different strategies, as Dan's mentioned, uh, with transference into trust. We've talked about discounts. We've talked about leasebacks. But the other aspect is philanthropy. And we are finding that clients are interested in in gifting uh, some of their passion assets to, directly to institutions or other entities. Um, I'm going to open this up to Dan and Anita. 
Uh, can you just share with the group what kinds of requirements should go along with gifts to museums? And then just some due diligence practices that clients should be aware of when they're thinking of gifting to an institution. Dan, I'm going to let you start and then I'll finish. Okay. Yeah, I, I would say, well, it's starting with the due diligence. Obviously, you want to look into the museum you're gifting to, make sure that it's well run, make sure they're going to take care of that object. Make sure that they have the capacity to take it on, or sometimes you know you're talking about multiple paintings. Make sure they have capacity for multiple paintings. Understand what would be permanently in storage versus what might be displayed for some period of time. The absolute though number one legal requirement has to do with deductibility and how long the museum would hold the object and if they would sell it, and if it's for their charitable purpose. And effectively, what that means is when you gift the asset, you want to make sure that they're going to hold it for at least three years and that the object that's being donated meets their charitable purpose. It's really pretty easy if it's a piece of artwork going to a museum, but you run into more complex situations where it may not be artwork or it's art or an object that isn't quite within line with what that particular museum does. And I think you have to be a little bit more cautious about it. So making sure that that's something that is in the gift agreement is, is of the utmost importance. Sometimes we come upon people that have made a promise to an institution. Uh, sometimes they've done that personally, and then they try and fulfill it with a foundation. That also is problematic because any pledge you make to any charity, including a museum of anything, has to be fulfilled by the person or entity entering into it. So a simple solution for that is to make pledges that are both from foundations and from individuals, and you can do it either way. That's, that's something we see an awful lot where people are making any sort of charitable gift, including to museums. I would say those are the main things to watch out for and keep yourself out of trouble, but you, you wanna be really careful when you're dealing with an institution and a hard asset, uh, like a piece of artwork, to make sure that it's in line with your expectations and with legal requirements for the deductibility if you're doing it for charitable purposes and, and the deduction that comes with that. Thanks, Dan. You know, there are a couple of points that I would like to make from our long history of dealing with many clients. The first is many of our clients are very, very philanthropic and they very much want to donate their collections to institutions. Um, what really is important is to understand what is in the best interest of the institution, right? It is a burden to catalog, serve, and exhibit collections. So if you're going to donate and they've agreed to accept your collection, you may also have to provide an endowment to support that collection because you don't want a museum to go broke supporting your collection. Right. That's number one. Number two, you may actually find if you have a real conversation with them that they really need the money. <laughs> they really need the money and they don't need the objects. So there are other ways, and this goes all the way back to your discussion with your trusted advisors, other ways for you to take your objects and turn them into a philanthropic goal. Obviously, your deduction may be different but it is something to consider. You could take your collection, put it in a donor advice fund, monetize it in the fund and do whatever you want with the money, right? There are lots of different strategies. The other thing I would mention, if you're going to have to get an appraisal if you donate your collection to an institution in lifetime, and that appraisal um, will be fair market value. You may remember I gave you one exception to the fair market value rule. And that's with donation. If you have an object that does not have a secondary market, meaning that's only sold at gallery, or it doesn't have a strong secondary market, and that, that argument can be made by the appraiser, the IRS actually allows you to use a retail price. And that's the only exception we see. So you have a scenario where you can take a piece of art that you can't sell, but you may be able to donate it at retail replacement value and get a better deduction. Can I just add one thing, one, one important thing to that, which is, is good to note on valuation. You want to be cautious. So let's say you've bought something from a dealer who also does valuations. Mm 
there's mm -hmm. a pretty specific rule that you can't use the person who was involved or company that was involved in the transaction when you acquired something for your charitable donation valuation. So you really often need to seek an independent party to do that. Um, and that includes auction houses as well. So if you buy at Sotheby's, you cannot have Sotheby's do your valuation per donation. Um, whoever it is. So we just did a very large um, valuation for a, a huge collection. And there were a variety of dealers that work with that client. That obviously eliminates the dealers from being able to provide that valuation. Thanks for that clarification, because that uh, that is an issue that many clients aren't always aware of. And then um, just one more question related to donation, Dan. Did you see an increase in uh, clients wanting to donate in 2020 uh, due to due to a favorable tax situation or, or or not necessarily? And do you foresee more people thinking of donating to entities going into 2021? What what are you finding from the standpoint of planning? Uh, and philanthropy with your clients that are discussing philanthropic endeavor? For most of our clients, I would say it's it's sort of always pretty steady. 2020, there was a special rule where you could uh, sort of get more juice for your charitable donations if you did it in cash. So there was certainly more conversation around selling and donating the cash and running some numbers around that. Uh, but I, I would say for most of our folks, it's been sort of steady interest. and. We're, we're always looking at putting this sort of thing in people's estate planning documents, doing it actively while they're alive and, and all sorts of situations like that. Okay, thank you. Um, we're close to our uh, end of end of the presentation period, and we've been addressing questions throughout the, the panel presentation via the chat. If anybody has any additional questions at this time, um, our, our team of panelists is more than happy to address any other questions that you may have whether it's related specifically to asset types, the market, uh, wealth transfer strategies, discounting fractional interest. We did cover a lot of different topics today. So please feel free to send in any additional questions via the chat function, and we're more than happy to address the, uh, the questions. Uh, I'll just wait a few seconds, and if we don't have any additional questions, uh, then we're gonna wrap up today's session. Uh, I have a question uh, for Anit and Dan. Uh, when you're doing a sale leaseback, at least the sale leasebacks I've been involved with, uh, the seller uh, has a right at some point in the future to repurchase. How does it work? Trust. Sending that over to Dan. The, um, the rent rate. Teeing it over to you, Dan. It's a good question. So I can't say that we often would put in an absolute repurchase right because that looks an awful lot like you haven't uh, completed your gift if you're gifting and then leasing back that being said most trusts so that you get that income tax treatment where the rental payments would be ignored called grantor trusts most trusts to get that treatment would have a provision where the settler of the trust could substitute assets for other assets and that's really akin to a sale you just take other assets in your own name maybe that's stocks and bonds, and you substitute those for the fair market value of the artwork at the time you would make the substitution. So there's ways to sort of plan for the ability to get that asset back if you want to do it, but you're not really sort of getting it back without trading something of value. That's really no different than buying it back. And most of the trusts we plan for, even if there was no rights in there like that, they have friendly trustees who may consider that if the value was fair and you're not going to run into any self-dealing issues or other somewhat complicated issues to affect something like that. I would say for most of our folks, though, if you wanted it back, I would think twice about using that as your trust planning asset because there's no guarantees to plan on the trustee cooperating. I would say as a mistake, even if it's your best friend, you just you just never know. You may not get somebody to do it and you truly have lost some level of control once it goes in that trust. So those provisions typically don't exist uh, in a uh, gift uh, lease back. No, I, th I think you want to be cautious about which provisions you use and not, and people try and get creative in some ways to satisfy clients. But for the most part, if you could stay a little bit more plain vanilla on the overall gifting slash sale strategy and lease back, have a really good and, and detailed trust that has flexibility and some other options that way. 
overall, that's a safer planning scenario. And that's where that's the side we tend to want to be on. And are there um, trusts with sufficient capital uh, to actually do a sale lease back? In other words, purchase it so that they oh, grant sure. or cash right. back. Absolutely. And sometimes the reason you do that is, let's say we've moved a closely held business into a trust, more sort of normal traditional estate planning, and all the distributions from that company are building up in the trust. One way you get the settler, the mom and dad or mom or dad access to that cash, which is now in trust, let's say for the descendants, is you start selling assets to the trust for cash. And we see people do that with vacation properties and artwork and other high value assets as a way to get money out of the trust and put something in the trust in exchange for that money. And then of course, if they're still gonna use it, you should pursue the lease back. Good question. Okay, well, thank you so much. And thank you everybody for attending today's session. A uh, special thank you to Dan, Jim, and Anita for uh, sharing their insights on wealth transfer strategies for art and other passion assets. We have recorded this session and we will be sending um, everybody who's attended a copy of the uh, recording uh, in case you missed any of the concepts that were discussed and there were a lot of issues that we discussed today. So thank you all for attending and have a wonderful rest of the day. Thanks so much.